Speaker, I'd like to ask the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster if he will make a statement on whether or not the Government will seek parliamentary approval before triggering Article 50. Minister John Penrose. Yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the question of how to invoke parliamentary discussion around triggering Article 50 has two distinct facets, one legal and the other democratic. To take the legal considerations first, I'm sure everyone will be aware of the debate around whether invoking Article 50 can be done through the Royal Prerogative, which would not legally require parliamentary approval, or would require an Act of Parliament because it leads ultimately to repeal or amendment of the European Communities Act. I will leave the lawyers to their that was very enjoyable and highly paid disputes, and apart from observing that there are court cases already planned or underway on this issue, so the judges may reach a different view, I would simply remark that government lawyers believe it is a royal prerogative issue. But I hope everyone here will also agree that democratic principles should outrank legal formalities. The Prime Minister has already said that Parliament will have a role, and it is clearly right that a decision as momentous as this one must be fully debated and discussed in Parliament. Now, clearly, the precise format and timing of those debates and discussions will need to be agreed through the usual channels. And as everyone will understand, I can't offer any more details today because the discussions simply haven't happened yet. But I will venture a modest prediction, Mr. Speaker, that I strongly doubt they will be confined to a single debate or a single occasion. There will be many important issues about the timing and the substance of different facets of the negotiations which the Government the Opposition and the Backbench Business Committee and, I dare say, perhaps even you, Mr Speaker, will feel are important to discuss. But the details of which topics, on what dates and the specific wording of the motions, we shall have to wait and see. Thank you. Helen Goodman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the Minister for that reply. If the Royal Prerogative is used to trigger Article 50, wouldn't this be a clear breach of the promises made to the public during the referendum campaign by the Brexiters that they would take back control and restore parliamentary sovereignty? How could it be right? How could it be right to initiate negotiations with important and far-reaching significance for citizenship rights, immigration rules, employment and social rights? agriculture, trading relations with the EU and third countries, Scotland and Northern Ireland, without seeking Parliament's approach for the aims, objectives and red lines. The issues at stake are the culmination of 40 years of legislation. Isn't it extraordinary to suggest that changes to these should not now come back to this House? The priorities and trade-offs are extremely important to everyone living in the UK. Surely he is not suggesting they should be decided in Whitehall behind closed doors while Parliament is presented with a done deal. Isn't the Minister's inability to say how Brexit will be negotiated a clear indication of the Government's failure to do any contingency planning? Why is the Chancellor of the Duchy wasting taxpayers' money on fighting a court case to keep the Government's approach to Brexit secret? We know he can't say today what the red lines will be, but why can't he at least be clear that Parliament's approval will be sought sought before (coughs) the negotiations begin? When will he be able to say what the process will be? He says these are matters for a new Government. Has the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead been consulted? And could the Minister tell the House, when will we have a new government? (laughs) Minister Ben (laughs) Um, A considerable burden has been placed by the Honourable Lady on Minister Penrose's shoulders, uh, which is a burden he seems to bear sturdily with fortitude. But it would be good if we could actually hear his response. Minister Penrose. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I shall try to bear up under the pressure. Um, uh, Firstly, I would uh, would just gently say to the Honourable Lady that uh, it is difficult to argue that the Government's approach can be said to be secret if it's in court. It isn't a secret court. It will all be argued out um, in public. Um, And I I think I've just said that these issues will be revealed as we go forward with the new Prime Minister. The point I hope which I can reassure her about is very straightforward, which is that my right honourable friend for Maidenhead, who looks like she is going to be the new Prime Minister, um, has been very clear in saying that Brexit means Brexit. What that means is that the destination 
to which we are travelling is not in doubt. The means and the how we get there will have to be uh, explained, but I think it is only fair to wait until she is Prime Minister and she has a chance to lay out her programme and she has a chance to lay out the process and therefore when Parliament will be, uh, have a chance to discuss and debate these issues and at that point I'm sure all will be revealed. Mr John Redwood. Uh, Mr Speaker, isn't the way to take back control and seek parliamentary approval to proceed quickly to repeal the 1972 European Communities Act whilst transferring all European law relevant to the single market into British law, but at the same time protecting our borders and keeping our contributions. That's what we voted for. Will the new government deliver that promptly? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, as I just said, the the important thing to, I hope, reassure our right honourable friend about is that uh, the right honourable uh, lady who represents Maidenhead has been clear Brexit means Brexit, and that means that the destination, which he and I both share, um, is not in doubt. The question of how we get there and precisely how to run the negotiations and the precise timing of what gets addressed when, I hope both he and I will allow um, our uh, soon-to-be-installed new Prime Minister time to to lay out, but I'm sure that she will at the first opportunity. Louise Haig. Thank you for granting this question and to my honourable friend the member for Bishop Auckland for raising it in this House. The outcome of the EU referendum represented the most momentous constitutional change our country has faced in the post-war era. Now is the time to take a considered view on the future of the negotiations and for the new government to lay out the timetable, including when they anticipate Article 50 will be triggered. Article 50 should not, however, be triggered until there is a clear plan in place about what the UK will be negotiating for and how that is going to be achieved. The Government has already indicated it will consult the devolved administration and the Mayor of London, and it must do the same with Her Majesty's official opposition. This is the only way we can develop a consensus about what the country's negotiating plan should be, and that should be put to a vote in this House. The priority must be to ensure that the Government's negotiating team, undertaking the most substantial set of negotiations on our behalf in modern history, are fully equipped, fully resourced and fully prepared to extract the best deal possible for Britain in the Brexit negotiations. 170 trade agreements now need to be renegotiated, but it is suggested only 20 people across the whole of Whitehall have the requisite experience to negotiate. We have deep concerns that the autumn statement, which outlined drastic cuts for Whitehall long before Brexit materialised as a, real, uh, possib- uh, as a realistic possibility, is no longer fit for purpose. That is why Labour are saying to this Government, while discussions about Article 50 are vital, clearly what comes next matters even more. It would be an abdication of responsibility if our civil service negotiating team do not have the resources they need and are instead forced to spend vital time implementing brutal budget cuts at home when they should be batting for Britain abroad. So let's properly resource our civil service and let's develop a consensus together for the future of Britain. Minister Penrose. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm I'm pleased to hear the Honourable Lady um, saying that there's an opportunity here for cross party consensus. I think it is going to be much more powerful for this country in any negotiations it undertakes, both with um, EU, other EU member states but also with other countries around the world if they know that the, um, the political parties and the people of Britain are speaking with one voice and that we are anxious to be an outward looking international country which is uh, aiming to establish new links around the world. So I, I welcome her comments on that. I also would agree with her that it is important that we have a clear timetable as soon as our new Prime Minister is in place, if only because, and she again is right to point this out, that the details of the timetable have to be geared to maximising our negotiating leverage. That We know where we're going, the question is how we get there, and clearly the order of play, the order in which issues are addressed, and the timing of those um, has to be um, planned out incredibly carefully to make sure that we get the best deal possible, as I think she mentioned. final point I would also um, add to uh, agree with her on is this point about the devolved government. She's absolutely right that we need to make sure that they are involved as well, so it isn't merely a question of consensus, cross-party consensus in Westminster. It has to be a question of consensus, and as far as it is possible to achieve, right the way across the UK. Dr Liam Fox. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister originally said that he would trigger Article 50 immediately, so presumably he felt he had the full legal authority to do so. Does my honourable friend accept that those who want to have a vote before Article 50 is triggered are not concerned with parliamentary sovereignty? It's a clear attempt to thwart the democratic will of the British people. 
they must be completely resisted by any real Democrat. The referendum was not a consultation with the British people, it was an instruction from the British people that we have a duty to obey. Minister. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I would strongly agree with my right hon. Friend and Parliamentary Neighbour that the question here is not the, uh, the legal power, which clearly, as the Prime Minister has previously uh, mentioned, is available. The question is the, what is politically and democratically right to reflect the decision that has been made and, and in the referendum itself. And therefore, while the Prime Minister is, I think, very sensibly saying that the timing and the, uh, and the method of trigger, triggering Article 50 needs to be a decision taken by his successor, uh, I think also that his successor, who we now know who that will be, um, is very, very clear and also right to say that the British people have spoken and that Brexit means Brexit. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think we're grateful to the Minister for, first of all, confirming that this will be done through royal prerogative. And given the events of today, perhaps that's the way we could determine the leadership of the Conservative Party. But can I also remind him the, the, the soon now to be depart, departed Prime Minister's remarks, where he said that the Scottish Government will be fully consulted within any Brexit proposal. So can he, first of all, confirm that before any process is started in Article 50, yep. the Scottish Government are, are fully consulted and they Should give their consent possible. for any sort of move forward? And it's also reminding the Minister that Scotland didn't vote for this Tory-inspired yeah, Brexit, yeah, 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 and it's yeah. the Scottish people who, 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 for us, are sovereign. We've yet to hear any government minister say that they respect the Scottish result and that they are prepared to make sure the Scottish people also secure what they voted for. This government might be charged with taking the UK out of the EU, but these benches are charged with ensuring that the Scottish people always get what they voted for too. Yeah, yeah. Minister. Um, well, Mr Speaker, I'm uh, delighted to confirm that the Scottish Government will be involved. In fact, I believe that there are already um, some early discussions underway, um, and I hope and expect uh, that those will continue, as they will with the other devolved governments around the UK as well. I would, however, gently uh, remind the Honourable Gentleman that uh, this is a cons commitment to consult, uh, but it is not quite the same thing as an outright consent, because, as his own party has, has accepted very recently, this is an issue which is not a devolved issue. It is something which is to be dealt with by this Parliament and the UK as a whole, and is something which is therefore a decision which we have as a country taken collectively and together. Mr. Crispin Blunt. Last clarification, which um, means that we are not seeking consensus um, as, a, as a term, but, but uh, we'll be seeking consensus, but, it's, but, but, uh, but uh, it may well, it will almost certainly not be, not be forthcoming from the uh, Scottish national benches. And would he confirm that there is no escape from doing this via Article 50, to which we are bound by treaty, uh, and whatever other parliamentary processes that then come uh, behind that, uh, it is our treaty obligations that we have to meet through invoking Article 50, which is the instruction of the British people. Uh, and will he ensure that that is uh, enacted, that is put in place as soon as we have our negotiating uh, hand in place? Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I, I would agree with my honourable friend on those, both those points. Firstly, that consensus is always desirable and to be sought wherever possible, um, and also that Article 50 and that route is the route for achieving Brexit. Um, he's also right, though, to point out that it is only the tip of a much larger iceberg. There are a whole series of other things that have to wrap around that. We've heard some of them mentioned um, during the course of this urgent question already today, Mr. Speaker, and I suspect we will hear more of them in due course. Mr. Ben Bradshaw. Is it not the case, Mr Speaker, that referendums are advisory and that this Parliament yes. is sovereign? Absolutely. Isn't it a constitutional outrage and a supreme irony yes. that those people over there That's who right. base their argument for Brexit on parliamentary sovereignty now want to deny this House That's a right. vote and, right. and suggest that an unelected Prime Minister unelected, with no mandate, agrees to such a fundamental decision for this country. It's a disgrace, and they must not be allowed to get away with it. Minister. Mr Speaker, with the greatest possible respect to the right hon. Gentleman, who is extremely experienced, um, he may be right on um, strict constitutional legalities, but I'm afraid that dem democratically he is fundamentally wrong. Uh, we have had a referendum, the people have spoken, and it would be unconscionable, it would be impossible for us collectively to turn around and thumb our noses at the British people and ignore the result of that democratic verdict. Mr Bernard Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I point out that it would be 
extremely odd uh, for the first time in this Parliament's history to start taking instructions on how to conduct our decision making from the Administrative Court, which seems to be implied by the case before it. And can I just point out that were legislative consent actually required for the exercise of Article 50, that legislative consent was effectively given when we passed the EU Referendums Act, which established the referendum and put the question before the British people. Well, well, Mr Speaker, I, I will, uh, will endeavour to tread carefully because, as I mentioned before, there are um, cases either in train or, uh, or planned. Um, but I think that the, the fundamental political and democratic point must be, must be uh, this, which is that the people have spoken, and whichever side of the argument, either members of this House or out in the, uh, in the rest of the country, were on, it is now up to all of us to come together, to unite as a country, and to make sure that we respect the democratic decision and the democratic will clearly expressed. Tom Break. Uh, the Minister is an honest man, and therefore when he says Brexit means Brexit, he knows that there are as many versions of Brexit as there are members on his benches here today. He needs to reaffirm parliamentary sovereignty and ensure Parliament can vote on the Government's negotiating stance, for instance, on the vexed and dangerous question of what happens at the Irish border. Yep. Yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, as I said in my opening response to the question, um, I'm sure that there will be uh, many opportunities and many different occasions when uh, this chamber will want to discuss and debate all sorts of different issues, including the one that he's just mentioned, but many, many others too. This negotiation will be an ongoing process, not a single event. And therefore, he's absolutely right that there will be many, many opportunities where specific issues will become salient, where people in this chamber will have very strong views, people in devolved governments will have very strong views, and those views need to be heard and they need to be aired throughout that process. Sir Edward Garnier. Thank you, sir. Would my honourable friend agree with me that there is just the slightest chance that over the next few weeks we may be capable of generating more heat than light on this subject? It isn't the House of Commons, it isn't Parliament that is going to be negotiating with the European Union as we come out of the European Union. It will be the Government. Uh, and would he ask our right honourable friend, the uh, Chancellor of the uh, duchy uh, to ensure that whilst Parliament should be kept informed and whilst Parliament may express its view, it will be for ministers and for the Prime Minister essentially to carry out these negotiations once Article 50 is triggered. But Parliament should not hamper the negotiating stance of. Should not hamper. I think somebody wanted their lunch. Uh, should not. Should not constrain should not constrain the negotiating tactics of any government minister. Minister! Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I think my right honourable friend gets the, the parliamentary war for optimism, saying that there's only a slightest chance that we might generate more heat than light on this over the course of the next few weeks. Um, but I think he's absolutely right that uh, this is something which ministers need to take forward. But, as I said in my earlier remarks, I'm absolutely certain that both the government and the opposition and the backbench business committee and others will take many different opportunities to make sure that Parliament's views are forcefully expressed and the issues are debated as we go. Mr. Keith Vaz. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister will know that the triggering of Article 50 will have profound consequences for the three million EU citizens who are currently living within the United Kingdom. Has the Minister for Europe, who is sitting next to him on the Treasury bench, had any representations from other EU countries about the position of their nationals here? And if not, will we be able to have clarity? as to whether or not they have the right to remain, because at the moment ministers are saying different things with regard to these rights, and we need this certainty before any triggering of Article 50. Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, the, the point, of course, is that there will um, be ongoing discussions about this and many other issues. Um, and the question about when those discussions might bear fruit, particularly given the fact that uh, there have been some concerns about informal negotiations being inappropriate, um, is something which uh, will have to be resolved. At this stage, um, I'm afraid I must give him the same reply which I've given to others, which is that we need to make sure that we have a programme which will be laid out by the new Prime Minister as soon as she is in place. And at that point, I hope that she'll be able to give him more detail um, and more clarity on that specific point, along with many others which will also be involved in the negotiations. 
Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. In terms of the doctrine of the sovereignty of Parliament, isn't it true that it is a sovereignty delegated by the British people, not a sovereignty given to us by divine right? It is absurd to think of the sovereignty of Parliament as being by divine right. It is of the divine right of kings. And therefore the British people have spoken. They have given us a mandate, and that mandate must be fulfilled. Yeah. But the details of that mandate will no doubt be implemented by legislation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, Mr. Speaker, I, I will defer to my honourable friend and parliamentary neighbour on the, uh, the details of the legalities about where the sovereignty begins and ends and where it, where it is delegated from and to. But the fundamental point, I think, um, is very, very clear from both his remarks and I hope mine earlier, which is that the people have spoken. There is a democratic decision which we are now, I think, honour bound to deliver, and therefore we should not um, try and resile from that or in any way step back from it. I expect that the Minister also defers to his honourable friend on the matter of knowledge of kings. <laughs> Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Minister be considering the proposal put forward by a thousand lawyers today which calls for the introduction of a royal commission or an independent body to receive evidence from a wide range of groups and about particularly the risks and benefits of triggering Article 50 at different times? And will he ensure then that that will be able to report before Parliament votes? Well, um, Mr Speaker, uh, I don't think I'm being overly cynical to, to wonder whether or not um, a proposal by a thousand lawyers for a commission to deliberate at length might possibly be a delaying tactic. Um, and I think that the concern will be that uh, we need not to tie the hands of the incoming new Prime Minister um, or indeed of her negotiating team in the way that we approach this. As the lady from the opposition front bench rightly pointed out earlier on, uh, we need to make sure that whatever we do and however we handle this it is aimed at getting the best deal possible for this country, not just with um, our European, uh, other, other European member states, but also with other countries in the world as well. Mr Andrew Tarry. We've already got quite a bit of controversy breaking out and we scarcely started this debate, but the Minister has been doing a great job with his outpouring of common sense. Uh, today on, on a heap of these questions. Will he just confirm that all common sense points not to triggering uh, Article 50 until it's in the UK's national interest yeah, yeah. to do so? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the Treasury Committee has uh, pointed out and reported on, and as the <coughs> Governor of the Bank of England and a large number of other people who have been closely involved in these issues uh, have also concluded. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm very happy to, co to confirm that this is not a question of if we, um, we, we leave the EU, it's a question of how. And therefore, the, the calculation which we all need to take and which the new Prime Minister and her team particularly need to take um, is the best way to, to uh, structure the negotiations and to time those negotiations to maximise our uh, negotiating leverage. And I'm sure, therefore, that she will, um, as we will all have, will have read uh, the Select Committee report with great care and will take those factors into consideration. Chris Bryant. The Minister said right at the beginning of his first answer that this wasn't just a legal matter, it was also a political matter. So I cannot see for the life of me why the government is challenging the legal case. Surely it's just a complete waste of money to send lawyers, the, whether it's ten lawyers or a thousand lawyers, it doesn't matter. Why on earth is the government wasting money on trying to assert that this is just a matter of royal prerogative rather than accepting the political fact that, yes, Brexit is Brexit. That may be the case. But the truth of the matter is he's far more likely to get a good deal out of other European countries if he's managed to bind all sides of this House and both Houses of Parliament into a strong negotiating position. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I, I had thought, I had hoped that perhaps when the Honourable Lady who spoke for the uh, Opposition Front Bench stood up that she was perhaps speaking for uh, more people on her side and that we were going to be able to achieve some degree of cross-party consensus on this because I think it is um, helpful if we can achieve some degree of um, uh, country-wide unanimity on it. I'm very, very sad, therefore, that it doesn't look as like there is that degree of unanimity on the opposition front benches. And I would just um, also, also venture, Mr Speaker, um, that I have seen next to me the, the Attorney General, um, who is convinced and that the government's case is strongly arguable, and that is why we are, um, uh, and that is why we are taking this case to court. Mr. Philip Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're in a strange situation where last week the results of the referendum were so catastrophic for the Labour Party they passed a motion of no confidence in their leader. Whereas today 
The result of the referendum is neither here nor there. Uh, we can just proceed uh, and, and keep ourselves in the EU because of parliamentary democracy. Uh, perhaps I'll make their mind up soon. Doesn't what we've heard today emphasise the point made by my honourable friend, right honourable friend for North Somerset that these? I, I want to hear the yeah. honourable. Well, I don't care whether other people want to hear them or not. We are going to hear the honourable gentleman, the member for Shipley. It's as simple as that. I don't care how long it takes, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Isn't what we've heard today show what my right honourable friend for North Somerset said is true? That these devices are not here to try and help the government implement the will of the public. What they're asking for is the right to try and stop the will of the public being implemented. If the, if the government doesn't implement this of, because Labour frustrates the process, they will be wiped out in the north of England in a future general election. Yeah, yeah. So they might be hell-bent on self-destruction. But can I ask the Minister to save the Labour Party and make sure he implements Brexit in full? Uh, Mr Speaker, there are, there are many reasons for implementing Brexit in full. That's the first time anyone's ever urged me to do it, to save the Labour Party. And I'm particularly delighted to hear it coming from my honourable friend, the member for Shipley. Um, I, and I would also uh, agree with him that there will be a nagging concern in the minds of some people, unworthy though it may be, that some of these proposals to delay um, or to subject to, to, um, to uh, intricate parliamentary procedures might be to try and frustrate the democratically will, uh, expressed will of the people. And that, of course, Mr Speaker, would be democratically entirely wrong. Yeah. Mr David Winning. I supported Remain. I have no regrets or apologies about that in the slightest. But is it not absolutely essential that the majority decision taken, rightly or wrongly, should be respected? Otherwise, it makes a complete mockery of democracy. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, beautifully and eloquently expressed. Um, we are all, I hope, Democrats first and foremost, and whichever side of the uh, referendum debate we were on. In this House or more broadly across the country as a whole, we have to respect the democratically expressed will of the British people. Mr. Bob Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to see the Attorney General in his place on the Treasury bench. Does the Minister dissent from the proposition uh, put forward by Sir Paul Jenkins QC, the former head of the Government Legal Service, and many others, namely that A, Article 50 is the only lawful route for exiting the EU, B, that is a matter for the Royal Prerogative, C, the, the 2015 Referendum Act is not of itself adequate at all in law to, to constitute notice under Article 50, uh, and finally, that to unilaterally repeal the 1972 European Communities Act, other than through the Article 50 process, will be a breach of a treaty obligation, something which this government, no government has done in 300 years and will be wholly unconscionable. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, he asked four questions. The answer to the first three is a straightforward and simple yes. Um, the, only, the only gloss I would add to his fourth question about how we might either amend or repeal not just the European Communities Act but any others that need to be amended as a result of Brexit um, is that they will of course inevitably require primary legislation to do so. That will of course have to be brought forward um, when the time is right. Margaret Ritchie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Reference has already been made by the Minister to discussions with devolved regions. Could the Minister outline what discussions have taken place with the Northern Ireland Executive, the Northern Ireland Assembly, and the Irish Government? Because there are particular issues there to do with the need for free movement of goods, services, and people. Otherwise, it will be very detrimental to the whole economy of the island of Ireland. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady is absolutely right. These are extremely ticklish and difficult discussions. Um, I can confirm that the, uh, that the, dis that the discussions have begun. Um, I can't, I'm afraid, go into any huge detail here as to how far they've got or what the future plans are. Um, but again, if, she's in any, if she has any concerns or doubts about how they might be progressing in future, I would encourage her to come to me or indeed to the Northern Ireland office. I'm sure that we'll be able to um, set her mind at rest. Mr David Jones. Does my honourable friend not agree that it would be positively contemptuous of the will of the uh, British people so clearly expressed uh, if uh, this government were to refuse to trigger Article 50? And what does he feel would be the response of the British people at the next general election who encourage that such contempt should be shown to their views? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, my right honourable friend makes a very important point, which is that um, it is essential for the health of our democracy as much as for the future direction of this country. Um, for 
uh, voters to understand and to believe that we here um, hold their opinions in high regard and that we are um, morally, feel ourselves morally bound to deliver on those uh, uh, views. Uh, if we ignore their democratically consent, uh, expressed consent, then we will be in a much, much bigger problem than we are currently. It will be something which will undermine the very foundations of the democratic consent which underpins this place. And I cannot think of a more dangerous route for us to go down. Mr. David Lammy. 